Well, greetings to you all, friends, in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's always good to be here among you folks. And I'd have to say that one of the things I look forward to, in addition to talking with you, is to hear, George, you pray. It stirs my soul. Um, I'm just deeply blessed by your leadership in the morning. Let's take our Bibles today, and we'll turn to Proverbs chapter 16. We'll be reading the first 17 verses of the chapter, Proverbs 16. But let's first pray and ask for the Lord to bless his word to us, not only in the reading and the preaching, but also in the hearing as well. Let us pray. O Lord, our God, our Father in heaven, we rejoice in a beautiful day, not merely because of the light and the warmth, the beauty of the day outwardly, but inwardly and spiritually, because it is the Lord's day. To think that on this day, Christ rose from the dead. He conquered death. He overcame our guilt and sin at the cross. And there in the tomb, now empty, brought forth everlasting life to those who would believe him. And Lord, this is your doing in our hearts to create that faith through which we are saved. We delight to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, to sing his praises, to pray in his name. And Father, as we now come to his word, we pray that you would give your Holy Spirit to us that we might be taught of God, and that as we grow in not only our understanding, but that we would grow in that very faith, to love him as you first have loved us in him, to walk with him, to be built up in our knowledge and in our trust of him. Lord, Lord, guard and guide our way and make us in every step that we take to be conformed to the image of Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Proverbs 16, this is the word of God to us. The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of a man are clean in his own sight, but the Lord weighs the motives. Commit your works to the Lord and your plans will be established. The Lord has made everything for his own purpose, even the wicked for the day of evil. Everyone who is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Assuredly, he will not be unpunished. By loving kindness and truth, iniquity is atoned for, and by the fear of the Lord, one keeps away from evil. When a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Better is a little with righteousness than great income with injustice. The mind of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. A divine decision is in the lips of the king. His mouth should not err in judgment. A just balance and scales belong to the Lord. All the weights of the bag are his concern. It is an abomination for kings to commit wicked acts. For a throne is established on righteousness. Righteous lips are the delight of kings, and he who speaks right is loved. The fury of a king is like messengers of death, but a wise man will appease it. And the light of a king's face is life, and his favor is like a cloud with the spring rain. How much better it is to get wisdom than gold, and to get understanding is to be chosen above silver. 
and is our focus today, verse 17, the highway of the upright is to depart from evil. He who watches his way preserves his life. And this far in the reading of God's holy and inspired word. Having read this, I'd say as an opening statement that each of us is going somewhere. You may feel that you're going nowhere in life. And yet I assure you that as things are going on in your life, and even though you may ask what is going on with them, they are not only heading somewhere, but you yourself personally are walking by them, and you are going somewhere. It leads us to ask ourselves this kind of question. Just where am I going? Just where is it? Where am I going? Where do I want to go? And not only should we ask ourselves these questions in terms of life, but more so eternity itself. The Proverbs have much to do with this and with our, could we say, way of life. Even here in the 16th chapter, we have read of the importance of our way and the way that we take. We saw it there at verse 2. All of the ways of a man are clean in his own sight. Everybody thinks it's right. We all think we're going the right way. Verse 7 is another one. When a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Or again, verse 9. The mind of a man plans his way, but the Lord is the one who directs his steps. And our focus, of course, verse 17. The highway of the upright is to depart from evil, and he who watches his way preserves his life. Such a verse leads us to ask of ourselves, just where am I going in life? And just where will I go after life? Much of that has to do with the way we take in life. And as the prophet Isaiah, as Solomon here in Proverbs preaches, a highway of holiness. That's the way that the Lord puts before us. Once again, the proverb says, the highway of the upright is to depart from evil, and he who watches his way preserves his life. This is the way to go. This is the way. As another proverb says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. And so we need then to look at three points of this proverb, verse 17, that show us the way to go. And therefore we need to see first, what is the way? Secondly, we want to see how to stay on the way. And then thirdly, we need to see why to take this way. What, how, why? First then, what is the way? What is this way? Although most modern versions of the verse faithfully render it as highway, that probably is not the best translation, though it is sufficient in all ways. Another translation, the New Living Translation, says the path of the upright leads away from evil. Whoever follows this path is safe. The highway that Solomon here in this version, the New American Standard Bible that I read, does not here speak to a paved road with two or three or maybe four lanes, but this is a path. This is a road. As one commentator has said, as he calls it, the beaten path. It's a path that's known to people. Many people are trotting on it every day. 
Lots of people are walking it. We might call this path life. People are all over this path. How a person goes over its various landscapes, encountering different people, different places, different things, and where he arrives, in what condition he finds himself, these are the things that are relevant for us to think on in terms of this path. That is the way that is here in view, life's direction. Of course, the way is an important idea biblically. And like many, in any way, it's set down here a dividing line that differentiates, could we say, north and south, east and west, one side from another side. Like the common highway that we take, this implies two different directions, two different destinations, two different ways of traveling. One is this way, and the other one is that way. Scripture commonly recognizes that both logically and theologically. We read of the way of the scoffer and the scorner, and we read the way of the righteous in Psalm 1. The path of the righteous is as the dawning of the day, we read in Proverbs 4, until it's shining in the noonday sun, but the path of the wicked leads to darkness. Or there are those words of our Lord Jesus in Matthew 7. That the way is narrow, the gate is small that leads to life, but the way to destruction is broad. And here also at Proverbs 16, again, the highway of the upright is to depart from evil, and he who watches his way will preserve his life. So what is the way? As the proverb says, the way is to depart from evil. Just as the street sign that named the street being traveled or have to do with identifying different directions, things like Main Street or First Street or whatever road or avenue it's called, so there is a name to this way that God's people are traveling. The name of the street is called Depart from Evil. That's the name of the way that we take. I ask you then, are you on the road that's called Depart from Evil? Are those the directions that you're taking when you walk with Christ? Have you heard of this road? Is this the kind of thing that you know where it is, that you know what its significance is, where you are in relation to it? Every single one of us drive on highways that are old enough that take us to our destination. It may be a long trip. It may be a rather short trip. Some of us use Google Maps. Some of us are well accustomed to Rand McNally. But we have directions, and whether our trip is long or if it's short, there's always something about our trip that says, you are here. You are here. The proverb meets us and identifies us as starting off here in sin. That's where we begin our journey. You are here. You are a sinner, spiritually dead in sin, physically born into sin, willfully performing sin each day in thought, word, and deed. This is where you and I are. We think it. We desire it. We do it. This is our path. This is the road where your life begins. It's the road that you and I naturally are traveling. And if uncorrected, it will be the way that will bring us to death, the way of sin. There's therefore a need to own the fact. Yes, to own the very fact, whether we wish it were different about us or not, that this is our way. I am here. This is where I am. I'm a sinner. 
What is then needed? Do we need to make a U-turn? Not quite. Because this doesn't take us off of the road. The proverb says that the highway of the upright is to depart from evil. To depart from evil. You must leave the path altogether. You cannot just change lanes. You cannot just pull over and stop. No, you must get off the road altogether. You have to go and take a different route. Go another way. And for such you have that upright heart inside who look higher for a better, clearer sign for the way to go. The sign reads, depart from evil. Depart from evil. You think of Christian fleeing from his city of destruction. There he was, you remember, convicted of his sin. And the law is convicting him, motivating him to travel. And he's got the law planted there, as it were, as a roadside sign to testify to his conscience. The wages of sin is death. And so what did Christian do? Sadly, he stood still. And then God sent evangelists along and asked him, Why do you stand still? To which Christian replied, because I know not whither to go. Whither shall I fly? An evangelist points over a field and said, do you see yonder wicked gate? And so Bunyan tells us that the man left the city and began to run. And when you look at Christian throughout the story of Pilgrim's progress, he's always departing. Christian is still leaving. He's always fleeing. He was on the way that was called depart from evil. That was his highway, just as it must be for each of us if we are to be saved. We must ensure that we take the right road, which is called depart from evil. And so given that you are here, a knowledge of your sin should lead you to a way of repentance, a way of departing from known sins. Or as the psalm puts it in Psalm 34, depart from evil and do good. Charles Bridges wisely would have us to observe about ourselves. He says, quote, The real injury is not from our living in the world, but from the world living in us. That's the real danger. It's the world in our hearts. I wonder if you can look at yourself, traveler, in life and see that this is the way it is, that this is what the Apostle Paul was talking about. Even when he, a seasoned Christian, an apostle for Jesus Christ, said, wretched man that I am. Not that I was. Wretched man that I am. Who will set me free? from the body of this death. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is what Martin Luther said, getting at it in his first of 95 theses. He said, when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, he willed that the entire life of believers is to be one of repentance. You get on the road of depart from evil, and you keep departing from evil. This is what the Westminster Confession is getting at. When it says in chapter 15, section 5, men ought not content themselves with a general repentance, but it is every man's duty to endeavor to repent of his particular sins particularly. Lifelong journey in this direction and on this road called depart from evil. And so the way of departing from evil that begins with sin and only by grace winds and turns to repentance on its course comes to a dead end, but with a new path, an exit ramp to Jesus Christ. Because as he said, he is the way and the truth and the life. 
And no man comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the door. Robert Frost, if you know his poetry, no clear adherent to Jesus Christ and his cross. In fact, he referred to himself, I believe, as an Old Testament Christian. Nonetheless, he illustrates something of this. Unknowingly, in his famous poem, The Road Not Taken. Maybe you'll allow me a little English class uh, indulgence here to read the poem. He says, two roads diverged in a yellow wood. And sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other, as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for that the passing there had warned them really about the same, and both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, some more ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Jesus' cross, if you have ears to hear it, is very much as what he here calls Robert Frost, a divergence in the road. It occasions here a man to consider, which road should I take? Just which way should I go? And yet having taken this road less traveled, he comes to doubt if I should ever come back for that other road that he declined. And thus this taken path that once wanted where, he says, has made for him all the difference. Friend, if you have ears to hear it, that is the way it is for you, should you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the better claim. It is knowing how way leads on to way. There is knowledge by faith that walking this path of following Jesus Christ and departing from evil means that the other way seems more unlikely to be returned to and trod again. Do you not find, seasoned Christian, that the older you get on this path of depart from evil, it is in a sense as the things of glory become more real and before your gaze that the way of going back to the ways of sin is a distant path. And that like Frost here in the poem, that if I take this way, then it seems I may never take that other path. If you're righteous in Jesus Christ, and you take the path that leads to life, the way of the gospel is, is that you will be so led by God and that road diverged in the wood that it's very unlikely, indeed it cannot be by grace, that you'll ever go back to that other road. This is what Solomon is preaching here. That the highway of the upright is to depart from evil, and he who watches his way preserves his life. How interesting that Christianity, saving faith, in Jesus Christ was called the way among the earliest Christians. Surely this is not the way to go as some congratulations for our self-righteousness. No, this is the way to go if we are to have everlasting life. It's seeing ourselves as sinners, repenting of our sins, believing on Jesus Christ, and having the guarantee of everlasting life, such that it's unlikely, it's highly unlikely, that God, having provided this, would make for us to return to another path. Friend, this is the way. This is the highway of the upright. 
But it leads us to see, secondly, then, how to stay on this way. How to stay on this way. The Proverbs told us the what, and that is to depart from evil. But it also tells us here how to stay on the way. A way that is sometimes difficult, sometimes a slippery path, sometimes it is rocky, it is bumpy, it is often winding in its course. We don't see where it's quite leading us. Seemingly only uphill, many ways unknown to us as to what is next. How then do we stay on the way? One word. The proverb says, watch. How do you stay on the way that leads to life? The highway of the upright is to depart from evil. He who watches his way. Preserves his life. You watch. You don't merely watch out, but you watch it. You guard your steps. You pay attention to where you're going. You heed the path. You walk the path. You watch it and go with it. Each year, many people in vehicle crashes have them due to various reasons many of which have to do with watching. They're distracted by an object that's off to the side. They see a deer in the field, and so they watch the deer. They see a beautiful home with landscaping, and they get caught up in the idea of, oh, maybe I should do that. And they end up being in a car crash. Others are busy texting, listening, or fiddling with the phone. Others busy watching the passenger in the passenger seat and talking, and so they get involved in the conversation, and they do not see and cannot respond to what's come before them driving. Disengaged, not watching. How do you stay on the way that leads to life? You watch. You take heed. You pay attention. There are plenty of things that will distract you in the Christian life. Things that may interest you. Theological controversies, that's one of them. Disagreements had even between sincere brethren in the faith. Things like an issue that the world is raising against Christianity or against Christians. Maybe it's some fad. Or it's some trend that has to do with popularity. Maybe it's things that are utterly harmless in themselves, such as the news, or TV shows, or entertainments, or some interest, or opportunity that now with this rare thing of free time that you have, that you're now distracted. You're pursuing an interest. And so what does it do but it puts you in a vulnerable situation? Your footing is a little bit unstable. You give your strength and your alertness to something else that you could have given to Christ and maybe you should have given to Christ. We can be a distracted people. The proverb is saying you must watch. He who watches his way preserves his life. We read in Scripture, Watch your heart with all diligence. Watch out for the leaven of the Pharisees. Watch and pray that you do not enter into temptation. Watch. That is how to stay on the way that leads to life. But there's not only distraction. There are some things that will take you by surprise as Christian people. And these two happen on the roads that you travel. They can happen to you on the way of discipleship. There's the trouble of other drivers. The uncertainty as to what other drivers will do. Or what maybe they won't do. Dangers ahead. Potholes that can come and sink us down for a quick moment and absolutely ruin our suspension dangers ahead, sudden turns that 
take something different than what we were expecting. And so what do we do? We spill our drink. Samaritan bandits of ill-intentioned people along the way of all sorts. And of course, there's the rather seasonal but still disappointing phenomenon of road construction. All sorts of obstacles and troubles that are on our way that make it so that we must watch. We must watch. These things happen in the Christian life. There's the brother or the sister who suddenly swerves, sins against us and scrapes us up. And so now we have to deal with some damage. There's a trial, financial, spiritual, physical, suddenly pulls our tires into it, and then we need some sort of alignment because we've gone off course. Or we realize that the map that we had laid out in our hands by God is actually something that we've taken upside down. And so now we're trying to straighten it out, and we lose control of the vehicle. Various road constructions. Remaining sin. That sin that the apostle said so easily entangles us. It's difficult to shed bad habits. My son recently got his driver's test passed. And I see in teaching him that I have a lot of bad habits in my driving. It's hard to shed bad habits. It's that way with the Christian life. We have to watch what we're doing. So how do you stay on the road that leads to life? You have to watch. All these things, they've taken us off the road. Even so, we keep our hands on the steering wheel, or maybe to age the metaphor, we keep our hands on the plow, and we keep going. We keep persevering. We walk and we don't take our eyes off the path. We watch the road ahead. We look at the Savior who's gone through and arrived and is seated behind the veil in his destination of glory. We have hope and we continue. Watching the road truly means that we fix our eyes on Jesus who is not driving, but he has sat down. He's arrived in glory. We don't drive when we drive looking at or staring at the lane dividing lines that are just above the hood of our car. It's not how we drive. We drive looking ahead. And we look at the landscape. We see the target that our mind's eye has as it changes as we're driving. Well, how much more so for Christ who is constant? He's fixed there in heaven. And so we fix our eyes over our hood, as it were, and we look at Christ alone. The Proverbs speaks to the upright, the only one righteous by faith in Jesus Christ, and it is implied that this person, is it you, is being addressed as an already upright traveler, a person able to walk, able to drive, as it were, interested to go and travel in his proper highway lane of uprightness, departing from evil. As it were, he is at a fork in the road, and he is being faced with an urgent crisis of what shall I do? At what will I look? Will I veer off the course or will I watch? Will I fix my eyes on Jesus? That's how you respond to every temptation. It's how you stay on the road. I fix my eyes on Jesus Christ. I lift up my eyes to the Lord from whom my help comes. It is for you as a believer in Jesus Christ a regenerate, converted person by the Spirit of God to turn your foot from sin, to depart 
from evil. Every evil way. Watch your way. Go in the right way of holiness that leads to life. Paul's version of this to Timothy reads this way. 2 Timothy 2.19 Everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain or to depart from wickedness. So what is it then about your way that you must watch? If you are to stay on the way, how are you to do that? Is it a character trait? Something like impatience? Something like laziness? Something like pride? Something like harshness? Whatever it is, is it a character trait? Is it something that has to do with an action? Maybe an outburst of anger. Maybe it's something like gossip or slander. What about inner thoughts? Things like malice. Things like jealousy. Discontentment. Envy. What is it that for you is how to stay on the way? What is it that you need to watch? Just how will and need you place a watch on these things? Proverb is very clear. He who watches his way preserves his life. Thirdly then, why to take this way? We've seen what, we've seen how, and now why. Solomon tells us, it's there in the proverb, he who watches his way preserves his life. That's why. Preserve your life. Keep it. Your great goal and destination in life is what Paul said to the Thessalonians. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. And may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. God will preserve your life. God will keep your life. But even so, as Paul commanded Timothy as it pertained to his ministry, so you and me for our lives. 1 Timothy 4, 16. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things. For as you do this... You will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. As Pastor Timothy for his congregation, even so us as parents to our children, certainly so us for our souls. If we watch them, we will preserve our lives. God preserves you in the way of life. But you persevere in it. Preservation is God's. Perseverance is yours as the saints. It will be no other way. Now back to our friend Christian in his Pilgrim's Progress. When he was departing from the city of destruction and all of its evil, do you remember what he yelled with his fingers in his ears not looking back behind him. Remember what it was? Life! Life! Eternal life! Remember that scene of Christian, how silly he might have looked, running with his fingers in his ears. But that was a man who knew why to do that. Eternal life. He who watches his way preserves his life. Why would you take this way? Life. 
If you watch, you will preserve your very life and therefore fill your mind, fill your heart and your thoughts with the things of eternal life. Fill yourself with the things of eternity. This is why John wrote his gospel, is so that you would believe on the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and believing would have life in his name. You think of the Bible then. Think of your Bible studies. Think of preaching. Think of family worship as signposts that are regularly put along the way. Why are they there? To remind you and me of why we're traveling. Eternal life. Is it not going to be worth it at the end? When we've passed how many, many, many signs to have finally arrived. Thus it will be for you and me. Should we leave family or farms? Should we endure pains or persecutions? Jesus said there's a hundredfold in the age to come. You receive eternal life. That's worth it. The fellowship with God. And Jesus Christ, all the redeemed that have gone before us, angels in glory, we see the full scope of God's plan and we say, it was worth it. Eternal life. You are grieving in this time. As a congregation, as a dear woman of God, you folks see that especially in the valley of the shadow of death, remember that God gives the preservation, even as he calls you to perseverance. He does this for those who have left us in death. And God will do so for us. You've walked for a time in the valley of the shadow of death. And now you're coming back in the valley of tears. Even so, God preserves. And he calls you even here to persevere. Maybe you're tempted to pull over and rest in a way that God says, no, keep traveling. You'll be further ahead for it if you keep traveling. Don't give up. Don't turn aside but persevere. He who preserves his own life is the person who watches. And the person who watches and fixes his eyes on Jesus Christ will preserve his very life. Can you imagine, with all of this traveling so long and over and through such hardships, that near the end of traveling as the car is sputtering, and the exit is just ahead, and it seems that we're out of gas, that a car pulls over and stops. What would that accomplish? Do you know that that sputtering is simply that you're out of gas? Do you really know that you have enough gas? Many times we reinterpret our situation. And we don't recognize that God will preserve us. God's given us the wind in our sails. He's given us gas and fuel in our tank so that we will arrive. It will accomplish nothing if we pull over. It will accomplish us nothing if we turn around or stay still. We must go. We must continue forward. And as we come to the end, and it may be that we're sputtering up the exit ramp, and we make our turn, thankfully the light is green, and we pull over right, and there's our destination, the very first house on the right. We pull into the driveway and... <laughs> then it's done. But God will preserve us. God will enable us to persevere. And that's the way that we handle 
all of our trials, even those in the valleys. The highway of the upright is to depart from evil. And he who watches his way preserves his life. Watching your way is not simply looking at the tank arrow and trying to figure out just how close is that to E. But it's looking ahead and seeing that the F is fix your eyes on Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured the shame, despising the cross, and has sat down. Persevere, friend, because God preserves you. It's motive to persevere. This is why to take that way. It's all about God showing his sufficient grace and in the end the glory of his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we've seen the what of the way, we've seen the how of the way, and we've seen the why of the way, we have seen our Lord Jesus Christ. And one day as this goes its fullest course, we will see him face to face. What then do we do? We depart from evil. We stay the course watching. And in the end, we preserve our life. This is the way to go. Let us keep traveling with hope in the Lord. And let us now pray. O oh Lord our God, as we think on the difficulties of the traveling, and we see that there is so much harm and evil, there is so much inadequacy about ourselves, there's so much confusion about the directions that are clear. But Lord, we are often confused. We're ignorant. We bring our own pride, our own interpretations of things, and we so with difficulty walk by faith, travel by faith. And Father, we ask that the Spirit of God will bless this word to us, that with whatever trials that we're meeting today, and we'll see tomorrow, and maybe are thinking about in the days past. Lord, lead us to persevere, and help us to see that our Lord Jesus Christ is by his word and spirit with us along the journey. And Lord, we ask that you would bless this word such that we have perspective, that we travel well, and that it's not occasioned with much distress, but Lord, peace by the Holy Spirit. There's much to look forward to with our destination, and we pray that with those with whom we travel, there would be peace, there would be mutual building up and edification, and that, Lord, we might truly arrive with a sense of gladness when our trip is over. Help us then to look at others that have gone to glory, and how we may be even today returning through a valley of tears, that, Lord, we would have thus the strength of the Holy Spirit even in this leg of the journey. Bless us in all these things and yet more that we do not even see, for we ask it in Christ and for his sake we pray. Amen.